City of Faith Ministry, based in London, England, presents Atmosphere of Faith with God's end-time apostle of faith, Prophet Dr. Evans Opong. Great power, dynamic faith, prayer encounter, incredible miracles. It is your moment for supernatural visitation. Lift your expectation for divine manifestation. You this morning, Lord, even in the name of Jesus, amen. Hallelujah. Before you take your seat, please grab your Bible and, like the tradition of the houses, let's read a few scriptures and then we would sit down, amen. So, please take your Bible. And go with me all the way to the book of Second Samuel, chapter three. Second Samuel, chapter three. I'll read the verse seven, and then we'll jump to chapter twenty-one, and I'll read from the verse eight to the fourteen. Second Samuel, chapter three, verse seven, and then chapter twenty-one, verse eight to fourteen. Second Samuel, chapter three. Verse 7. And it says, Now Saul had a concubine named Rispa, daughter of Aya. And Ishboset said to Abner, Why did you sleep with my father's concubine? Go with me to chapter 21, verse 8 to 14. But the king took Ammoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Aias, daughter of Rispa, whom she had born to Saul, together with the five sons of Saul's daughter, Merab, whom she had born to Ariel, son of Bazalia, the Mahalotite, he handed over to the Gibeonites. Who killed them and exposed their bodies on a hill before the Lord? All seven of them fell together, but were put to death during the first day of the harvest, just as the barley harvest was beginning. Rispa, verse 10, daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on a rock. From the beginning of the harvest till the rain poured down from heavens on the bodies, she did not let the bears touch them by day or by wild animals by night. 11. When, when David was told what Ayah's daughter Rispa, Saul's concubine, had done, he went and took the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from the citizens of Jabesh Gilead. They had stolen their bodies from the public square at Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung them after they struck Saul down at Gilboa. David brought the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from there, and the bones of those who had been killed and exposed were gathered up. They buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the tomb of Saul's father Kish at Zela in Benjamin. And did everything the king commanded. After that, God answered prayer in behalf of the land. Hallelujah. May God add meaning to his word this morning. Amen. Please take your seat. I think the scripture that we read, if you followed closely, seems very contradictory to the season that we are in. Hallelujah. And I wonder how many of us have ever read this scripture in the Bible, amen, or this story. But this morning, I want to quickly speak to us on a topic I have entitled, The Heart of a Mother. The Heart of a Mother, or a Mother's Heart. A Mother's Heart. A Mother's Heart. And I'm sure by the time that we are through this morning, it may probably mean a lot to some of us in this place, because this morning God sent me on one assignment to bring a message of healing and a message of hope to one who is in despair and one who is in the place of hopelessness. Hallelujah. So this morning I'm speaking to us 
on a mother's heart. A mother's heart. Who is a mother? Who is a mother? And that's where I want us to begin this morning. And I was just trying to find out a few things about who a mother is. Remember, I'm not just talking about a woman. I'm talking about a mother. Amen. And the definition that I got for a mother is this. It says that a mother is the female parent of a child. Usually, it takes two to tango, or it takes two to bring forth a child, a man and a woman. Hallelujah. So, a mother is the female parent of a child. And it says that mothers are women. So, generically, we have women. And if you do a bit of math, we'll say that a subset of women is mothers. Hallelujah. So, we can infer from that mathematical equation that it's not every woman who is a mother. It's not every woman who is a mother. So, a woman is more of a generic term, but a, a mother is more specific. A woman is more of a generic term, but a mother is more specific. And I want to buttress this definition, if you go with me, all the way to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Go with me to Genesis chapter 2, then we'll come back to the story that we just read. Genesis chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 20 to 25, just to give us a bit more depth or foundation. And it says that, so God gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib who he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to man. The man said... This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And then go with me to the same Genesis chapter 3 verse 20. So note for me, Adam exclaimed and said that the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Then Genesis chapter 3 verse 20 after man had fallen and then God had come into the garden and then now God was meting out, let's say, punishment or trying to give them corrections or trying to bring about or to let them know the consequences of the action that he had taken. After God had meted out to Adam, to Eve, and then to the serpent for what they have done, this is what Adam said, Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. It says that Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all living. When God created the other half of Adam, when Adam saw the creation of God, he exclaimed and said that this is now bone of my bones and she shall be called woman. If you check the meaning of called, it means to cry out, to cry out. So it's like Adam saw the creature that God had made and cried out, this looks like me, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, but only cried out some kind of exclamation. He only made an exclamation, or he only made, he only tried to describe what he saw. So he says that she shall be called woman. She shall be called woman, which was not really a definition of who she was, but it was only an expression of what he saw. I don't know if whether you are catching me this morning. So it's like the first time Adam saw Eve, he only exclaimed, woman, woman. And then if you go to the verse, chapter 3, verse 20, after God had done or has had his way with them, he now came back and said that Adam named her. The first time he called her, the second time he named her. When you check the definition of name, it means to specify to specify, when it comes to name, you are assigning a duty or you are assigning a role to something. So the first time was just an exclamation. But the second time, he now saw what she was rather created to be. She was rather created to do. So it says, Adam did not call her Eve. But Adam named his wife Eve 
because now the reason for naming her, it says that because she would become the mother of all the living. The mother of all the living. So woman is more generic, but mother is more specific. Woman is more generic, but mother is more specific. For you to be called a mother, it means a special assignment or a special role has been created for you. You are not like the others. You are more special. So Adam now says, you are not just called a woman. You have moved from the outer. You have moved from the peripherals. You have moved from the generic. And now this is your specific assignment. You are a giver of life. You are a giver of life. You are not just like a normal creation of God. Now, this is what I need you to do. Every place that you touch, you bring life. You nurture life even in every dead situation. So this morning, I need a woman in this place to raise up her shoulders and to know that she is not as general as every other person it seems or expect her to be. There is a special role. There is a special assignment on your shoulders. When you enter into a space, when you enter into a, a sphere, when you enter into an atmosphere, you carry the capacity to induce and to inflict whatever situation with the life carrying ability that God has put in you. So he says that she shall be called or she shall be named. Adam named Eve. He named her Eve because she will be the mother of all the living. So when the world says that when women are in a place, all that you see is death or confusion, that is not the real or the original intention of God. You are a life giver. When you enter into a dead situation, you carry the capacity to transform. So you see, when man had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, when God needed to reinstate man to his position, he did so through a woman. Because his original intent is that woman carries the life-giving ability. So Jesus was nurtured in the womb of a woman, born of a woman in the fullness of time to still bring life. So you carry the life-giving ability of God. Or the Hebrews will say you carry the Zoe of God. So this morning we are renewing and transforming our mind, not by the definition of or the world has given us by, by how God sees us and how God has defined us. Remember when God created everything he made, he gave the authority to Adam to name everything that he had created. And scripture says that what Adam called it to be, it was so. So how Adam defined a mother or how Adam defined a woman is what she set the precedence for our lives. Not how our circumstance or the world define us. He named her Eve. And this morning, that is the foundation I want to set this morning. And I want this to sink deep into our heart. Because when we get this into our spirit, it will define the steps that we take. It will define how we perceive and conceive and how we deal with issues and how we deal with things that comes our way. Hallelujah. So Adam named his wife Eve. In the beginning, she didn't have a name. But later she did have a name. What am I trying to say? And even when Adam gave her the name, it was after they had fallen. So how bad have you got into? How bad the place have you got into? How bad the place have you got into? Adam did not forget Eve. So okay, let's consider my God. How far have you gone? How broken are you? How desperate are you? This morning, he still sees you the same way he made you. And after the fall, Adam named her Eve. Because she will become the mother of all the living. Amen. What are the roles of a mother? What are the roles of a mother? And it says that a mother has one of the most influential and important jobs in the world. And the text that I read from, it says that, and one of the most difficult, and I was laughing. 
A woman has one of the most important and influential roles in the world or job in the world and one of the most difficult. Amen. She's a chef. She'll cook breakfast. She'll cook lunch. She'll cook supper or dinner. She's a housekeeper. Your house needs to be in order. She resolves conflict. If her kids fight, she's the only referee between the kids. Hallelujah. She's an event planner. She'll have to plan all the hospital appointments, all the play times, everything that concerns the family. She needs to take charge. Hallelujah. She's a teacher. A mother teaches. A mother teaches. You teach your child the way that they should go. And scripture says that teach your kids the way or train up the child in the way that he should go. So when he goes up, he will not depart from it. It is one of the fundamental roles of a mother to train or to teach. Hallelujah. And he says that another role of a woman is that she, a mother is that she's a chauffeur. She does all the driving, drive to school, drive to hospital appointment, drive here, drive there. Hallelujah. Amen. One of the most important influential but yet difficult hallelujah and he says that she does the laundry she's a counselor she's a finance manager the little that you have you need to learn how to manage for every other activity in the home she's a healthcare provider when their nose is dripping you pick the tissue and you're always the one cleaning so when I see any of the three ones, they have any cold, I know that by all means, I'll catch one of the cold because I'll be the one that is always cleaning their nose. Hallelujah. God have mercy. Amen. And last of all, I think one of the roles that I read, which really touched my heart was this, that a mother is a world changer. A mother is a world changer. And it says that it takes 20 years to raise a child. It takes 20 years to raise a child. And all these 20 years, whatever the child will become is as a result of everything that is infused in them by their mother. So if they will become a rebel, it takes the mother. If they will become any influential person, it takes the mother. So if they will become somebody who say an Al-Qaeda, it depends on the mother. Hallelujah. So a mother is a world changer. It's a game changer. The product of who we are, apart from grace and every other thing, is as a result of what was instilled in us by our mothers. So a woman is a world changer. For 20 years of your life, you would be under the influence or the power or the touch of a woman. Whatever you would become, you can always trace it back to your mother. Hallelujah. So you, this morning, are a world changer. If you think it is only the politicians, if you think it is only the, the top businesswomen who are world changers, this morning I beg to differ, and I need you to redefine that you are a world changer. Whatever your child will become, you play a critical role in it. So if your child is going to become a president, it's because you pressed and pushed and trained and taught them everything they need to be. Whatever a child becomes for 20 years of their life, which is actually the defining moment of their life, it takes the role of a mother. Hallelujah. So this morning, you are a world changer. Then I concluded by saying that motherhood is a big deal. Motherhood is a big deal. Motherhood is a big deal. Because it takes so much more to be a mother. It takes so much more to be a mother. Hallelujah. You do all the extra duty things. It takes so much more. But for me, one of the most critical roles a woman plays is found in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And I want us to read this before I move on. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And Paul was speaking and testifying about a young man called Timothy. And he says this of him. It says that I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. That scripture touches my heart. Paul was seeing what Timothy had become, and the definition of Timothy's life 
Paul could trace to his grandmother Lois and to his mother Eunice. And I'm just thinking aloud, and I'm just wondering, was there anything, was there nothing else about Timothy than that which Paul saw? But I realized that everything, probably he hit on that sincere faith which was in his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice because that was the pinnacle, that was the pivot, that was the most important thing that defined the entire life and ministry of Timothy. And that pivotal or that important thing that defined the life of Timothy could be traced all the way to his grandmother Lois and then to his mother Eunice. So which goes to buttress the point that we define and redefine what our children ought to be. But one great expectation God has laid on our shoulders as mothers who love him and know him is to be able to train our children in the way that the Lord expects of us. The sincere faith, which means that there is another kind of faith which is not sincere. But Paul said that I see this clean, this pure faith in you, which I'm sure I can trace it from your grandmother Lois. I can trace it from your mother Eunice, which is also now in you. So the role we play in introducing our kids to God, for me, is the greatest assignment that God has given to us. Because if, if Paul could look at Timothy and could only see that sincere faith and use that to define every other area of his life, it tells me that it's a big deal. So whatever it is that we are doing for our kids, taking them to school, extra activity, one of the most important things is to be sure that we introduce them to God. Because that is the only way they would be able to live to the optimum of their life. They can be crushed education-wise. They can be crushed in all other areas of their life. And it can seem that their life has come to an end. But when they have this sincere faith in them, that faith would always redefine their circumstance and push them beyond whatever it is that confronts them. So the best and the most precious gift you can ever give to your child is to introduce or to build in them this sincere faith. The sincere faith that you build in them is what will define their life and their destinies. Hallelujah. So much more is expected of us, especially when it comes to mothers in the Lord. When it comes to being a mother in the Lord, you have a duty towards posterity. You have a duty towards generations that live after you. It's not just about you, me, and I. It's also about posterity. Hallelujah. Amen. So now let's go back to the scripture that we read. In 2 Samuel chapter 3 verse 7. And I don't know why most of the time when it comes to this season, I'm not particularly drawn to all the strong women that we know in the Bible. I always wonder. And when I sat before God, I was always wondering. I'm like, I just, I'm not just so thrilled about Sarah, a great woman. I'm always not th so thrilled about Esther, a great woman. I'm always not so thrilled about the Deborahs. I'm always looking for some weird or obscured woman who nobody talks about. I just don't know why. Hallelujah. And this morning I found one. And when I read the story, I felt so sad. And I really felt like crying. And it's like my, my heart was just broken. And I was like, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And this morning I want to talk about a woman in the Bible, I've never heard her name before, but a woman called Rispa. A woman called Rispa. And that is how I came up with the topic, A Mother's Heart. Hallelujah. And I'm looking at the life of Rispa as we are introduced to for the first time in the book of First Samuel chapter 3, verse 7. And the first thing that scripture talks about in relation to Rispa is that she is a concubine. She is a concubine. She is a concubine. It says that now Saul had a concubine named Rispa. Saul had a concubine named Rispa, the daughter of Ai. When we say somebody is a concubine, what definition a concubine is, is this. That they live officially with a man, but they are not the wife. They live with a man or let's say in a polygamous society where people were entitled to marry more than one, we had some men who would have wives and also have concubines. 
They say the archaic form of a concubine is a mistress. So they are not officially in a marital, as in they are not married when it comes to certificate wives to the man, but they live with the man as their wife. So wife in court. So they said that being a concubine is a lower status than being a wife. But this destiny of Rispa, she did not choose. I don't know who of us would decide to be a concubine as against being a wife. But it says that Rispa was a concubine. So then trying to find out more about Rispa, there was, there was a statement that was made about her that Rispa was a victim of her circumstance. She did not choose to be a concubine because I know the heart of every woman. You'd rather be a wife than to be a mistress. You'd rather be officially married to somebody and carry the status of a wife than to be regarded as a mistress of somebody. To live and stay with somebody and do everything you are required to do and not be officially entitled or recognized as the wife of the man. But Saul had a concubine, and her name was Rispa. A responsibility or a definition she did not choose, but it fell on her. How many of us have been, have been victims of our circumstances? How many of us have gone into a marriage and... Precious one, we hope you have been blessed. Go to our website for further information. www.cityoffaithministry.org Call our London office on plus 44-208-591-6377 plus 44-798-469-5287 www.cityoffaithministry.org Go to our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, City of Faith Ministry, a church without walls.